afternoon. Today I'm in Westminster with the Member of Parliament for Wolverhampton South West, which is Paul Uppel. Uh, he's the only CKMP in the House of Commons at the moment and he was elected in 2010. So Paul, what influenced you into coming into politics and why did you choose the Conservative Party? Um, as with anybody who goes into politics, I think it was a family background thing. My family, although I'm born in the UK, my family came from East Africa, from Kenya. And like many Asian families, not just Sikh families, it was a pretty tough time. There's Ugandan Asians as well, the Kenyan Asians. And life was made pretty tough for us. Not so much for my dad, but particularly for my daya, who, who sort of came over and we left a business back, back in Kenya. And I think as a family, if you go through that experience and you come to another country, I mean, it's hard enough to do it as an immigrant, just to make a life for yourself, make a quality life, give a legacy for your children. I think as a family going through that, that was quite a political experience. It taught us, taught me particularly, but I think it taught the family as a whole, that politics matters. You know, sometimes we can take it for granted. So I think as a young kid, uh, either when we were having breakfast or when we were eating roti in the evening, we'd always talk about politics. And I think through that process, it, it sort of uh, seeped into my soul, really. And uh, politics became quite embedded with me. Um, born in Smith, it came from a very strong Labour family. Very, very strong Labour family. Like most, most of our generation, uh, born, born in that era. And I studied um, politics at university. And it was during that period that I really thought, Actually, my politics and my values are conservative values, really. Because having gone through that experience, going through a state school, state primary school, and just sort of going through life, I realised that, look, I'll be very fortunate to be given the opportunities. Firstly, for us as a family in this country, which I think is a wonderful country, we don't say that often enough, people very quickly criticise the UK. But I've travelled and I think you won't find many better, better countries in the UK. So that's one factor. And second factor is just the whole idea of social mobility, which is my own personal story as well, where I've come from. I've been very lucky to be a member of parliament. The reason I'm a conservative is that I want to give that ladder to everybody else who's out there. I, I don't believe there should be any limit or any glass ceiling on anybody's ability. Now, people would say, is that particularly a conservative approach? Well, I think it is actually. You know, I, the city I represent, it's had a big socialist dogma around it for a long time. And I think just offering a conservative opportunity or a conservative way just gives people an option, which is why I stand on the political platform I stand on. And it's why, uh, you know, I've been so anxious and, and fortunate as well to go into politics as well as a member of parliament. Um, so having recently returned from India with the Prime Minister, could you talk to us about your experiences in India, what you looked at, what? Prime Minister did while he was there? Well, the, the, the initial visit, I mean, the, the primary purpose was obviously to build trade links mm -hmm. as well. But I think I, the main focus for me as a Sikh was going to Amritsar, going to Amritsar, the Varsab, and, and actually, I mean, first of all, just walking there with the serve, first serving British Prime Minister to do that, I think it's quite symbolic, it was very powerful, very humbling as well. And I had briefly chatted to him on, on um, sort of on the way over, and I said, look, the Prime Minister, if you feel uncomfortable with anything, you know, so I'm happy to sort of help. But the truth is, the Prime Minister is very comfortable in that environment. He's quoted it often as well in his speeches. Being Prime Minister isn't an easy gig, it's quite a tough job, and he often sort of remarks about being there, being quite tranquil, and that's what a lot of people actually say when they go there. They find a sort of spiritual centeredness, of it, and they feel very comfortable, and it's nice to have that base, that anchor. So that, for me, you know, first first time I went was as a child. And I remember going there and bathing in the water with my, with my family and with my father as well. And then obviously I'd be in bad, but then going back with a serving British Prime Minister, that was that was pretty special. Very special, very symbolic, I think. But it was something that, I mean, he had all sorts of advice about not to do it or to do it. And personally, it was his commitment to say, I do want to do this. So I think that shows how centred not just the Prime Minister is, but the fact that I think it's in a great message about putting, putting not just Sikhi but Amritsa particularly on the map and in a very positive way as well, which I thought was very good. When you said he got advice about to do it and not to do it, was that from people in the party then? Or? No, I think there was some resistance, just concerns from okay. the Foreign Office particularly. Okay. But I think he said the um, <laughs> I think he said the Queen and 
I so, said, so you'll be absolutely fine. We went there. There's no, no problem with it. So. But he was very keen to do it. He was very keen to do it. So that was quite nice. What, did he feel that it was different to the Gurdwara he'd visited in England? Or? Oh, well, I think you can't help that. You yeah. know, the whole experience is, 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 is totally different. Um, I mean, it's a bit of a media scrum that followed him around. It was quite nice, I think, when he was doing, he just went and see the, where the kitchens are and turned a few patties and stuff. But I always remember what was really quite nice about it was that there were these, um, there was these people there from Uttar Pradesh, really, really poor. And, uh, you, you know, and he, he saw them at the corner of his eye, and I got the feeling from the people who were trying to organize it, they just wanted to steer the Prime Minister away from that. So he went over and chatted to them. And he, and it was, that was quite nice because that, for me, embodies the whole Sikhi philosophy, regardless of your background, wherever you come from. When you're there, when you're doing seva, when you're, when you're eating or when you're helping prepare food or, or whatever, it's all about humility and levelling of human beings. And Guru Nanak Dev Ji, that's his central philosophy. You know, sort of Sikhi is born out of this whole idea, almost as an antithesis towards caste. So that was quite nice to see that as well. And that, you know, maybe I'm being a bit spiritual, a bit too philosophical, but that was, you know, personally for me, I, I found that quite fulfilling because for me that embodied the whole Sikhi philosophy and the central foundations and the tenets of Sikhism as well. So I felt that was something I was particularly, particularly touched by and particularly proud by as well. It was really good that he went. I know a lot of the Sikh community really appreciated him going. Um, did the Prime Minister or yourself raise any issues about human rights while he was there? Um, I mean, I'm not privy to that, okay? So I'm sure discussions were had. Um, I think it's important to note, and I know certainly, I mean, raised the whole issues that we've had recently on human rights. I know the Prime Minister is aware of that. And I know also ministers who deal with India are aware of that as well, and they raise those. But ultimately, you know, the, the judgment call on these are Indian judgment calls. You know, you can raise the issues. But I think it's important that A, we have those discussions, we have them in a mature way, in a narrative that is actually constructive. You know, sometimes you can find the discussion of this can be quite insular and introspective. It's important that it's always broad based and mature. And I think, you know, hopefully, I feel we're part of that process. Um, further following on from this, how important is that India UK relationship? I think it's a relationship, regardless of not just the 21st century, but looking back historically, it's been an incredibly important relationship. And I think it's become, going to become even more so. You can't deny that if you look at the connections that we have, not just with cricket, with everything that's going on in sport, but language as well. You know, so many middle class Indians, the language they want first and foremost speak is, is, is English. And you see that in Punjab as well. Um, and so there, there, is, there is quite a strong connection there. I'm not entirely sure we've really always got the best of, out of that relationship that we should have uh, for all sorts of reasons. And, uh, you know, I don't think there's, maybe previously there was historical baggage, but I don't see that as now. I think India is a very young country. I think people forget that sometimes. You know, the vast majority of its population is under 20 years old. So it's, it's governed by issues around the internet, social media, access like that. And I think it's important that we fill any vacuums or void that we've had in the past from an historical perspective. And that we actually show that you know, we want to build real, genuine relationships which take this thing forward. I mean, in my own constituency in the city I represent, Wolverhampton, you couldn't have a better advert for what's going on than Jaguar Land Rover opening up their plant there. You know, I was very fortunate. I, mean, I lobbied quite hard. Lots of them people lobbied quite hard. But I, what a process, I went over to see Jaguar Land Rover as well when they announced that they were coming just to the north of Wolverhampton. And I met with representatives from the Tata Group, the Vice Chairman there as well. And recently when I went to the Prime Minister, I met with um, Ratan Tata as well, just to try and cement that. So I think it's not just um, being a Sikh MP, it's somebody of Indian heritage that gives me a unique advantage and insight to how we can sort of build that relationship and take it forward. Because if you do marry the best of both worlds, you've got a really good formula for success and I think Hopefully we can build on that. The Tata story is just one story. We want to see that replicated in many, many more businesses and many, many more enterprises. So what you're saying is communication is the key. You've got to keep the door open and communicate with oh, yeah. everyone. You've got to communicate. I mean, we're not going to uh, approve of everything from an Indian perspective, and they're not going to approve everything from a British perspective. But what you've got to do 
is realize your commonality and where there's mutually beneficial relationships. And I mean, Jaguar Land Rover, Tetley T, you know, Tata and Steel as well. Uh, there are lots of examples of this relationship working really well together. And it's important we actually look at it, not just a recipient for this. I mean, I want uh, us to sort of look from an Indian, you know, so British English um, sort of businesses or British businesses going out to India as well and how they can make connections. They use British expertise um, in universities and in all sorts of other ways. We can actually build closer and stronger links. Since entering Parliament, what do you think is your proudest achievement? Uh, I mean, I was touched, as I said, by taking the Prime Minister, you know, to Amritsar. One of the things I'm personally proud of, I've been quite actively involved in promoting Sikh ethos free school. It's a free school. Lots of people not entirely sure what free school. So actually, this is a like almost an independent school, but there's no there's no recourse to, to parents to pay for this. It's paid for by the government, but taxpayer funded, and it has more sort of freedom, more more um, sort of different avenues. You can look at the curriculum from perhaps a different perspective. And in the city that I represent, Wolverhampton, last year there were only four boys. These aren't my figures. These are Lord of Donors' figures. Only four boys in the state system who've got five A stars at GCSE level. Now, if we're going to compete with kids from all over the world, we've got to do better than that. That's the reality of it. And I think for far too long, in Wolverhampton particularly, we've just had quite, how can I put it, quite an easy, unchallenging relationship with schools, and I think with, with the uh, sort of local authority and just how far we can go and how far we can stretch youngsters. And if we're going to get them to achieve the maximum they can and make them fulfill all their potential, it's absolutely crucial that we do this. So I think this free school, which incidentally, this is an six of the children who are coming to the Sikh Ethos School will come from a Muslim background. So it's actually open to everybody. It's going to stretch them. It's going to talk about Sikhi and the philosophies of it. But actually, in essence, it's going to stretch these and make them feel that just because they're from Wolverhampton, you know, there's just a certain ceiling, there's a certain bar there. Why shouldn't they feel they can do anything they want to? I mean, that was my personal story where I came from. I just want to inspire some kids to go and think, you know, if this guy can do it, why can't I do it? And there's, there's no reason. Half the battle is your own mental state of front, um, you know, frame of mind. The Chinese always say the first step is the hardest. It's true. It sets a tone and the direction of your journey. So first of all, self-belief is there. And I hope this school can be a real magnet for that. Then hopefully can provide a platform for kids to go on and not feel as though there's any limit to their, their ability, which I think traditionally the city in Wolverhampton has, has suffered from. Almost this inward-looking perspective. It should be more outward-looking rather than that parochial. So would you say that you're supportive of the free schools initiative? Oh, yeah. I think it's a wonderful idea. Um, anything that, I mean, you know, without going, I mean, my own personal narrative, I went to a state school and... You know, I was in a special class because I thought I couldn't speak English. And it was a conversation a primary teacher had with me that sort of started me on my way. You know, I'm, that, that is everything. You know, education. And Sikhi is to learn, of course. You know, there's a sort of spiritual circle here coming from that. That's always the perspective. Now, what would you say is the biggest uh, challenge facing Wolverhampton and what are you doing to tackle it? I think the biggest issues around this, the city of Wolverhampton are uh, addressing a history that it has around a low-skill economy. And in the 21st century, people are going to need all sorts of different skill sets to compete. Um, these, sometimes these are soft skills as well, you know, the ability just to sort of make connections with people, but also having the right IT skills, um, the ability just to basically compete with everybody on a stable footing and a fair footing in the 21st century. And I think traditionally as a city, we haven't done that. I know there was a report by the local authority, this is not a political point, I mean, this is a Labour local authority, which said that for far too long the history had been over-dependent on the public purse. You know, that's there in black and white. You know, and that's why the difficult economic situation we've had has hit Wolverhampton particularly hard. I think of between 2006 and 2010, nearly 4,000 jobs were lost in Wolverhampton South. So it's actually trying to turn that around. This ship has been sailing in one direction for a long time. And places like Wolverhampton, you know, which have a great industrial heritage, 
sometimes had that industrial heritage or that private entrepreneurial background replaced by public sector or quangos or, or just dependent on the public first. I think people would rightly ask the question, that's actually young people have said to me directly, you know, they've, they've spoken to me when I'm sort of at the temple, it's this really sort of given Wolverhampton prosperity. And it's actually anybody who lives in the city and knows the history of the city would be quite candid about this, regardless of their political views. And so I think it's important trying to turn that around. It's been, it's not going to be an easy job, it's going to take a long time, but I think Jaguar Land Rover is a real beacon. And they're bringing more private investment, actually encouraging people, A, to stay in the city as well. I think it will be something that will be incredibly useful and important as well, because sometimes I think we suffer from this baggage of people thinking I'm going to get, get an education, get an apprenticeship or get something and that's going to get me out of the city. Well, why should they feel like that? They should feel that they should be centred within Wolverhampton and feel they can contribute and put something back into the city. So you currently sit on the Prime Minister's Policy Board. Looking towards the next election, what do you think is the biggest challenge facing the UK? The number one thing which people are all concerned about is the economy. But I mean, within that, I look at um, various sort of areas of the policy board, like education, health, and also on transport. Now, I don't think anybody can deny that in, in, in health, there are all sorts of issues. You know, as we're talking, there's all sorts of um, sort of soul searching about, you know, sort of is the CQC doing an adequate job in holding hospitals to account? That whole ethos of a bedside manner is something that we need to really look at, which traditionally we have. Does the NHS care like it used to? So there are all sorts of issues, and there's issues around education. I mean, I'm very passionate about this, about providing that ladder of social mobility to anybody, regardless of their background. So I think those are big issues, but, but we can't deny the fact that big drivers around all this will be the economy. That's all. How are people going to survive in the 21st century when they're facing you know, this horrible term of global race? Then, you know, when I was growing up and talking about my own experiences, I was just competing with my peer group. My kids, they're going to be competing with kids from India, from China, who've got all those skills. So, so I think it's important how we equip everybody to deal with a different, difficult, and different environment than the one that I grew up in. And with regards to festivals and religious days in your local area, how do you communicate with the local residents around that period of time to send you your best wishes? Well, I'm a, I'm a trustee of a Sikh temple in, in Wolverhampton. But as an MP, any MP who does his job should be actively involved within the community. Meeting, it's about attending local events, functions as well, and just embracing it as well. Like you shouldn't feel as a member of parliament you're just there to represent one community. You're there to represent your entire community constituency and the whole of that constituency and all the various communities that you have within them. I mean, in Wolverhampton Southwest, there's a rich diversity of people from all sorts of backgrounds. But what does combine them and unites them more than anything is good old fashioned Wolverhampton common sense. And that's what you try and do as an MP. You try and bring that good old fashioned black country common sense and bring it down to Westminster, which sometimes can be a bit of a bubble and looks in on itself. So the whole purpose of this, your Britain, your say initiative, is to encourage the Bain voters and the black and minority ethnic voters um, to kind of vote for the party they best believe in or best, you know, shows their views um, or best represents their views. Is there anything you'd like to say to those voters in particular? I'd say to them, look, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to make a partisan point, but I'd say get involved in politics. I'm not saying, you know, sort of swarm into the Conservative Party or anything like that, but get involved in politics. Politics matters. I think as a community, and I sort of alluded to this in my first response, sometimes we take politics for granted. We do very well in educational fields. We do very well in business fields as well. But why shouldn't we as a community be involved in politics? We have so much to offer. And we have a dual cultural heritage perspective. You, know, you bring a British insight into it. And you bring your tr traditional Indian Sikhi views as well. And if you combine both, that gives you quite a strong platform. You know. As politicians, you haven't got the answer to every question. But if you have some sort of background other than politics, it does help you in this place. It keeps you centred. And sometimes you may not know the answer to a specific question, but you can look within yourself and from your own life experience draw upon that. And we as second, third generation, you know, sort of settled here now. We have so many solutions to the problems of the modern world. You know, if you look at the history of Sikhi, those issues that Gurnanak Devji spoke about, they're still as pertinent today. 
going all the way to Das Mopash, when Buddha and Zinki, fighting religious oppression, tyranny. That's, that applies as much today as it did a couple of hundred years ago, or five, six hundred years ago, if you go back to Good Nanak Dirty. The whole idea of equality, allowing people to have freedom to sort of practice the faith that they choose. It's very pertinent, and it shouldn't just be me who's saying that. I'd like lots of people, if they get the chance to watch this, to sort of get involved with that whole process as well. Well, thank you for taking your time out and answering these questions. If any of you have any follow-up questions or any questions for any other MP, send them to yourbritainyoursay at gmail.com, and I'll do my best in getting them answered. For now, check out the website, www.yourbritainyoursay.blogspot.com, um, and check out the next video when it comes online. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you.